Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is time for a house party. It's party time. The hotline is the party line. So pick up your telephone, because I know you're all alone, and you're sitting on your little machine, and you can't keep it clean, and you all reading the book, and you try to overlook, because you had L-O-V-E, L-O-S-T, Rapunzel, Rapunzel. Let down your hair and let me climb up the ladder of your love Because I do believe I muster Yes, I said I muster Uh-huh, uh-huh, I said I muster got lost That's right, ladies and gentlemen uh, We just wrapped up a very, very guile's weekend And trust me, this is the tip of the iceberg This is an English, uh, English lesson too Tippa, right? That's a word, like tippa gore Oh! PMRC, right? Judas Priest. Uh, what's his face? John Denver. Rocky Mountain High in Colorado. So anyway, I can play an unreasonable amount of uh, Jay Giles band songs on the piano, guitar, all of that. And did you like that little uh, attempt at, at copying Peter Wolf? Uh, on there, I, I did that, eh, you know, he has that like upper mid-range thing in his voice, similar to Freddie Mercury, and um, and not, not to mention, Peter Wolf is like up there with Freddie in terms of uh, frontman ability, he really is, Peter Wolf, call me, so anyway, check this shit out, yo, this is just uh, tea, regular tea, and if you believe that, in the immortal words of Frank Sinatra, I want to sell you 400,000 acres of swampland across the river in Jersey. Mm. This is good green tea. This one is Clatom. Look at that. You can't even see through it. Try it with the laser. Because this is, uh, well, this isn't really a party thing, you know, it's more of a chronic pain thing that legitimately helps people get through the day. As you can tell, I'm energized, I'm feeling good, and uh, I'm not like impaired really. I mean, I wouldn't want to like operate a spaceship right now, but uh, you know, opioids, opioids, lions and tigers and bears, oh snap, it, uh, it really, you guys are making a mountain out of a fucking molehill over there. All right, so anyway, Today we're going to talk about the Jay Giles Band and uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We're going to throw a few uh, shameful pot shots at them because they've uh, refused to induct the Jay Giles Band. I don't understand why uh, because I, they, I read an old uh, Rolling Stone article and we all know that the Rolling Stone guys, Jan Wenner, whatever, however you pronounce his name, and um, you know, they're like the same thing like the rock and roll hall of fame people the rolling stone people it's like they determine who's cool based on what they like you know it's like if you're not the sex pistols you're not cool it's very stupid but i did go to the rock and roll hall of fame once as a child i remember seeing bowie david bowie he, uh, yeah, as opposed to all the other Bowies that are famous, right. Um, he just signed his name Bo, B-O-95. And I guess he must have changed it every year, like Bo-96, Bo-97, just to keep it straight. Anyway, uh, I purchased a copy of The Bridge, the Billy Joel album, when I was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, yeah, I, I went home and listened to it and it was great. Incidentally, Liberty DeVito just uh, messaged me yesterday or maybe two or three days ago. And he said, man, bro, you know, bro is short for brother. That's what we say in New York. Yo, bro, what up, bro? Not really brothers, but people just say that because it sounds cool. Uh, he, uh, he said, man, you need to go out and play, play gigs more. I says, yes, I know, I know. Playing gigs is my bread and butter, you know what I mean? I'm old school. Did I stutter? I'm from the gutter. But check this shit, man. Right now, unfortunately, we're still in this COVID mode. <sighs> 
Oh, I just got a message from a university professor. Uh, let me put that on mute. Anyway, uh, so check this shit out. So, um, unfortunately right now, people are still afraid to go out to concerts and there's really not that many places to play. Um, my good friend who owned a cafe, he sold the cafe and he's, he's an older gentleman, you know, he's vintage and he's, uh, he's from Canada, but, uh, he's married and he sold the place. Uh, I hope he got what he was asking for it. It was a lot of money but it's a prime location and it's a really, really cool place. So he was great, you know, he always used to let me play shows, sometimes solo, sometimes with other guys. The problem is here in the country where I live, things are very disorganized. So there's like, I'm in a band right now, technically, but, and it's an established band that put out music and did shows but they don't practice and the singer doesn't even own a microphone. And I, I just got so sick and tired of telling these guys like, hello, you want to practice anytime today, whenever you're ready to be serious about rock and roll, let's go. You know, I, I can't understand it because I love practicing. It's called playing music. It releases endorphins, dopamine and serotonin. And it really does. They've proven that with rats and rats and mice anyway so check this shit so um so it's difficult to get bands together and it's like that in a lot of places uh like like they say in the the hired gun uh documentary featuring liberty devito it says like i think it's so what's his face uh rob zombie says like Psh. It's not about guys that can play, it's about guys that you want to be crammed into a van with, you know, driving across the country for a month, for a few months, whatever, at a time, which is true. And um, a lot of musicians, even guys that are, uh, <laughs> guys that are never famous and don't, they're not, you know, whatever, they think their, their ego is just too big, you know? And a lot of them are really like selfish, you know, and they break up bands for no reason or, or they just don't believe in themselves. I think that's really what it is. A lot of people, they're just like deep down inside, they're insecure and they, uh, yeah, like they just don't, they don't want to put in the work, you know, they don't want to put in the effort and do the gigs. And, uh, and I've lost a lot of money because of those guys. So I have to be very uh, selective about who I, uh, you know, who I work with. <laughs> Fortunately, I do have some, uh, some good musician friends in another part of the country, which is where we're going to move very soon to start the Rock and Roll Resort, which I mentioned before. We're doing this for real. Golden Triangle Studios. It's going to be up in the mountains. And we're gonna have uh, everything. I hope they 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 decriminalized weed already. So I just I hope they fully legalize and they create like a tax situation, and then they're just gonna sell it online. And uh, so we can do that. This is rock and roll, you know. Also, by the way, lo, my eyes are all pinpoint. That's because there's a really bright light up there. It's not from the Kraton, okay. I, I just watched a video of what's his face, uh, and I am gonna get to the point. I promise. I, I watched a video of the Motor City Madman. You know uh, what's his face, Ted Ted Nugent. That guy is is full of hate. You know, like he's a hate machine, and he's just like he hates everyone that's not him. It seems he doesn't have anything really good to say, or he doesn't say anything uplifting. And it's very, I know a lot of American people that are like that. It's really sad. It's not all Americans, but it's far too many of them. And, uh, you know, and he would say things like, like Trump, when Trump was like, uh, oh, I love the Mexican people. I'm such a good friend of the Mexican people. I raped the, ch oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Didn't mean that 12 year old girl. Um, you know. I, I love these Mexican people, but they're bringing drugs and they're stealing our jobs and we're going to build a wall. It's like you're really talking out of both sides of the mouth. And Nugent was saying the same thing about the MC5, the, uh, you know, classic band from Detroit, <laughs> Motor City. 
and he said like you know he, he said about mc5 like they're losers they're drug addicts their music is sloppy they're great men they're great men i love them i respect them but they're idiots and they're stupid and they're addicted and you know what he sounds like or what he really sounds like and i'm not saying he is but maybe he is maybe he's hiding it really well alcoholic trust me baby been there done that you see this fucking thing this is remy martin i got this for like less than two dollars and it was full it uh i got it from the japan secondhand shop like some japanese people just had it you know for a long time never drank it so this is i i didn't look it up to see how old it was and it doesn't matter because with whiskey and cognac once it's in the bottle it doesn't age any further only when it's in the barrel it mellows out from the wood um wine does continue to age in the bottle because it's a living system it's you know there's stuff in there microorganisms microorgasms a little what is it called a mini death that's what the word for orgasm in french something like that i'm an english teacher i don't know c'est la vie but anyway um <sighs> so yeah like Ted, teddy nugent he just sounds like he's uh he sounds like a drunk rambling old man just who thinks he's right about everything and nobody else's opinion is valid oh but they're great guys you know or like yeah the narcissistic like attitude like i don't agree with his politics but he's a great guy like why not just say he's a great guy you know for real, he's a great, you know, a lot of people are great guys. There's a lot of great guys out there, you know? Great girls, too. So, anyway, uh, check this shit. So, we're going to get on the subject of uh, the Jay Giles band. And, uh, okay, so we have some visual aids here. Now, you can see, this is the Jay Giles band. Here, let's do this professionally. Let's do it the right way. Oh shit. Steven Joe Vlad, drummer. Daniel Klein, aka DK, Dr. Funkenstein, bu -bu -bu bass, no treble. Peter Wolf. I actually forgot to look up his real name. I call him Peter Buchenmeister. That's not his real name, but it's something like that. It's an ethnic name. Uh, and this guy, Seth Justman. The th third greatest keyboard player in rock and roll history after Billy Joel and Roy Bitten. And this guy here with the slick back hair, that is Mr. Jay Giles. May he rest in peace. He's the only one who's, uh, who's not with us any longer, unfortunately. I think he died from cancer, uh, maybe from smoking, I don't know. But he, uh, after the fame, he just went back to straight up uh, blues, blues and, and jazz, and he loved it. And he also collected vintage Italian cars. And my father, I, I'm not sure if he raced with Jay Giles or if he just, uh, he spectated, you know, and watched Jay Giles race. Because my dad was a race car driver for about uh, 50 years or something like that. Uh, anyway. And last but not least, Richard Solwitz, a.k.a. Magic Dick. Talk to me. Magic Dick on the licking stick. So obviously that's an ethnic name, Solwitz. He's Jewish, you know. So he just changed his name to a male body part instead. But his real name is Richard. Like Dick Tracy, you know, the classic detective character. Um, yeah. My great my grandfather on my dad's side, his name was Dick too. But he wasn't he wasn't really a dick. He was a nice guy. I don't agree with his politics, but he's a nice guy. All right. So let's move right along here. The Jay Giles band started in the mid 1960s as the Jay Giles Blues Band. Now in this very grainy photo here, uh, this is Jay. He was maybe 18, 19 in that picture. There's Magic Dick. And uh, I, maybe that's Peter Wolf. It's, you can't see his face. Looks like there's another guitar player. 
So they must have had some lineup changes. Magic Dick is the best harmonica player in rock, period. Like, nobody even comes close. A lot of bands have singers who can work the harp. Uh, you know, like Roger Daltrey from The Who, Jagger from The Stones, um, let's see who else. I think every member of Jay Giles' band played the harmonica, but Magic Dick was like a full-time harmonicist. Oh, uh, John Popper, that's another guy who's really good from Blues Traveler. Um, yeah, he, uh, he got arrested with like an arsenal of automatic weapons in his car, something like that. Uh, okay, so anyway, yeah, check that out for real. Um, so everybody thinks that, well not everybody, but a lot of people who think that uh, the Jay Giles is just all about na 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 na, my angel is a centerfold. And don't get me wrong, that song's great too, and loves things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yaham. This is good for you. Mmm. Herbal. So anyway, they started out as an acoustic blues band. And then they were like a three-piece. Just the Magic Dick on the harp, Jay on the guitar, and uh, DK on the stand-up bass, upright bass, string bass, double bass, whatever they call it. So they added members, and uh, they went electric, and um, here they are. I believe that uh, Mr. Seth Justman over here is the youngest, youngest member of the band. So he, uh, he kind of like annoyed the guys until they let him join, and then he became one of the major driving forces. Everybody in this band <clears throat> is a driving force, though. They're all unique musical personalities, and every one of them could have and would have been a successful musician on their own. But together, they are far greater than the sum of their parts. So here are the handsome guys a little bit later. That first band photograph was from 1972, uh, from the, or maybe earlier, 1970 or 71, from the photo sessions for their first album, self-titled. <clears throat> this one is from much later. This is from like 81 after the, or 82 after their big fame with Centerfold. And uh, you can see th this is either from their headlining tour or from their opening tour for the Stones. Uh, and you can read about that in Mr. Keith Richards' <clears throat> autobiography where he says that they were doing a huge stadium gig with the Jay Giles band. And uh, Ronnie Wood was holed up freebasing in his hotel room. He was afraid to leave. And they, they somehow managed to put him on the stage and put a guitar in his hand. But uh, yeah, don't freebase, kids. And don't smoke crack either. It's not really the same thing, by the way. But uh, yeah, they're both bad. So uh, look at this guy, man. This is... The handsomest, most well-dressed man in showbiz, Mr. DK, Danny Klein, with this weird bass, man. People used to always use these in the 80s, like the Steinberger is the company. It's a stick bass. I think it was made with like a carbon composite type of material, so they're like unbreakable, but it has no body. Uh, and it has very little wood in it, so it doesn't have tone from a tone from tone wood which is real by the way like yes i know that guy glenn did the tone wood is bullshit video but uh he was talking about metal and then he said later like yeah it's because we use a ton of distortion if you're playing blues and yeah then it does make a difference that's why jay here jay giles has this really ugly gibson guitar that was probably a short-lived uh thing but it sounds great uh there's magic dick and there's Peter Wolf after he shaved his beard. There's the handsomest guy in the band with the Boston Celtics jersey, uh, Mr. Stephen Joe Blad. And of course, there is Seth Justman with the sanctuary uh, handprint thing. All right. And this is backstage, right? You can tell because it's like really, really ugly, like behind them. Backstage is really, uh, 
it's not what it's cracked up to be. That's why I'm doing this video here with clothes in the back and stuff. Because this is really what a backstage area looks like. Maybe not Elton John's backstage. Like he has white b wedding cakes with doves flying out of them. And then Billy Joel said, man, my backstage looks like the back of a deli. He used to call it the seagull platter, you know, because people just stand around the cold cuts like seagulls. And then, you know, his, his friends would come and drink all the beer backstage and eat all the food and then say, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> Whatever. Haters can hate, you know, but they hate themselves. Who you mad at? Me or yourself? Anyway, so check this out, G. Let's go on through history. Uh, now here they are. Uh, this is a picture from, I don't know, sometime within the, the last 20 years at least. So they're all nice and old. Jay is still alive, obviously, in the picture. There's Magic Dick. Looks like he put on a few pounds. He's drinking some whiskey. Here's a... Uh, Still dressed impeccably, Mr. DK. And uh, Danny Klein, the bass player, he actually started a band called Full House. After, uh, I think it was in the 90s or early 2000s, he just loves playing live. So he got a van, literally, and toured America with his own band playing their classic tunes. And he is one of the best bass players. And he's... Uh, what else can I say about him? He plays a, a flex bass, which is a bass with a whammy bar. These guys were cutting edge in the early 80s. They really were. Seth Justman, keyboard wizard. Uh, this guy, I think, is the replacement drummer because Stephen Joe Blad retired. And like my wife said, of course he had to retire. He played too fast. And he sings, too. And there's Peter Wolf with the bottle of champagne and the roses. He ain't changed. <laughs> Moving right along. This is one of the most classic rock and roll photos of all time. So here's Peter Wolf, right? He's in mid-flight. And then you got in the back two Flying Vs. Custom-made Flying V guitar for Jay. And a custom-made Flying V bass with a Fender neck for DK. And the big Hammond B3. This picture is so inspiring. Every time I look at it, I just want to jump up on some woofa goofa mama toofa. Peter Wolf is still like this. I mean, he doesn't jump as much, but I mean, he's like 75, maybe even older. And he's still a great singer. He puts out great solo albums. He tours and his shows are high energy, just like always. Uh, and Peter Wolf was nearly murdered by Jokar Tsarnaev. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jokar and Tamerlane Tsarnaev were the Boston bombers. They, they blew up the bomb at the Boston Marathon. These guys were, um, I think they were from South Ossetia, Georgia, or uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, something like that. And they were Muslims, but they weren't from Iraq or Afghanistan. The Islamic world is huge, and it covers three continents. Um, so anyway, obviously they were hated by their American peers, and they were taunted relentlessly in school. <clears throat> and I don't think the bullies who drove them to madness and to violence ever spent a day in jail for what they did. And I'm not saying that, that those guys are, you know, the Sarnaya brothers, I'm not saying that they're innocent, but there's more than two guilty guys in this story. Anyway, Peter Wolf lives right above the Boston Marathon finish line. The, the marathon finish line, is that what I just said? I need to get a finish line because <clears throat> my waistline is not thin anymore, baby. Maybe I need to play live more in under hot lights. <laughs> so anyway, um, he said in an interview, he was putting on his jacket and he was going downtown to check, or downstairs to check out the scene. He was already downtown because he lives there. And this is Boston, you know, Boylston Street, I believe it is. And uh, that's where the marathon finishes. So he was putting on his leather jacket and then boom, 
his apartment shook the whole building shook and he said oh shit and then he uh, you know he took off his jacket he looked out the window and saw the carnage and you know he realized that he was very close to getting it you know which is really i think that the joke the zarnaev brothers deserve the death penalty just for that for for targeting woofa goofa mama tufa you just don't do that guys anyway so moving right along uh peter wolf wrote a song about that experience and about all the the madness in the world called peace of mind all i need to find is just a little peace of mind it's on his solo album called a cure for loneliness it's a great name great title uh so anyway um one more thing I was going to say about him. Oh, yeah, in the song Peace of Mind, he says, uh, you know, what's the news going to say today? There's a battle over here and a bombing over there. And I was thinking when I listened to that song, it's like, there's a battle over here and a bombing right in front of my house. Like, <laughs> my God. But he's a survivor, you know? All right, so on with the show. Hotline. The hotline is a party line. For those of you who are too young to know what this is, it's a telephone. This is called a rotary phone. You put your finger in there and turn the dial. Each one has a number. So if you want to dial two, it's chook, just like that. And then it goes back. And they're very loud when they ring, so you can hear them anywhere in the house. And they're strong and they don't break. They're not like cell phones where you drop it in the toilet and it's finished. Like, these are reliable pieces of equipment. Anyway, Hotline. That's a Jay Giles album from 1975. All of their albums have funny names. Uh, so the first one was Jay Giles. The second one was Lady... Uh, the Morning After. Sorry, that was the second one. Third one was Ladies Invited. And then there were a couple live albums called Full House and Blow Your Face Out, which is a, uh, it's not about Tsarnaev, it's about Magic Dick. It's about the, uh, the harmonica, right? Blow Your Face Out. And these are well, well known to be some of the greatest live albums of all time. There, there it is, right there. Full House, Jay Giles Band Live. And I, I don't really, I don't know much about poker. I should probably learn more. But um, I used to be able to count cards at blackjack, and the casinos hated me for it. But anyway, I stopped going to the casino in Pennsylvania because it was so depressing. It used to be the, Allen, uh, the Bethlehem Steel Mill, which is in the Billy Joel song, Allentown. Out in Bethlehem, they're standing in line filling out forms. Uh, killing time, stand, filling out for a standing line. Uh, I saw those guys in real life, like people that used to work at the steel mill, and they lost their jobs, and now they're they're drunks and gambling addicts and stuff. But anyway, uh, this is not really a full house, <laughs> something like that. I don't know if you can tell me what it really is or what a full house really looks like. Oh, it would be. It would be two queens, right? Or two kings instead of a king and a queen. And the queen here is winking, you know? Which they don't really do in the real cards. But, uh, you know, this is from the vinyl days. Back when people used to lay there with headphones and, and just look at the record covers, you know? And... I went to uh, I went on a Jay Giles band spree cuz all I only knew Love Stinks and Centerfold. And then I read the Rolling Stone article with Kurt Loder, who used to be a great great uh critic, honestly. He's like one of the very few good music critics who actually respects musicians. And then he went on to be the MTV guy, MTV News. Uh but he wrote this thing about Giles on tour in the 80s and uh yeah, and, and it was uh, after that I read it, read the article, and I was like, hmm, uh, I wonder if these guys are actually any good. So I listened to their greatest hits, <sighs> my jaw hit the floor, and uh, then I went on a spree to find all their albums at uh, garage sales, flea markets, eBay, all vinyl, strictly vinyl, baby. And speaking of strictly vinyl, I was a guest DJ 
on Alaska Public Radio one time because this lady heard me playing piano and she's like, wow, you know a lot of good classic rock tunes. You want to be on my my radio program? It's called Strictly Vinyl. So we go into a room and pick out the vinyl records. I pick five, she picked five. I played Jay Giles. Uh, and I also played uh, Fourth of July Asbury Park Sandy because it was Hurricane Sandy during that time. But obviously, Hurricane Sandy was like in Jersey, and I was in Alaska. Woo! Roll it, don't control it. All right, so, uh, and vinyl, right? Jay Giles Band has an album called Nightmares, Tales from the Vinyl Jungle. Nightmares! It's an intense piece of artwork. All right, so check this. Uh, here it is, Monkey Island. You can see the title, it's like really small down here, Monkey Island, and they shortened their name to Giles. A lot of bands tried doing that in the late 70s. This was 77, and Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes uh, shortened their name to The Jukes for only one album, and then they changed it back to the long name. Atlantic Records, Amit Erdogan, one of the very, very few cool record executives, he signed the Jay Giles band. However, uh, they were well known for being one of the greatest live bands, but their records did not sell. Uh, they were people just didn't get as excited as the live concerts. And Giles band, the Jay Giles band, but they were well known for being like a live act that was, you know, they were opening for bigger bands and nobody wanted to go on after them because they were blowing headliners out of the water and the, the audience was exhausted, you know, after their set. But their record sales weren't doing so good, so Atlantic dropped them after Monkey Island. And it's really sad. And it's also, it shows that record companies really don't understand their own business. Because later on, maybe four years after this album, Na 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 Na, My Angel is a Centerfold, multi-platinum, huge hits, and they play it at like every football game in America. You know, it's up there with We Will Rock You by Queen, you know? It really is. Even people that don't know the song, they know the tune. And here is the uh, the inside sleeve, because in the vinyl days you would fold it out and you could see all this stuff. They gave you your money's worth when you bo bought a record in the old days. It wasn't this like, you know, just go to Spotify or whatever. I don't know. I mean, you know, I sound like an old guy complaining, but it's it's true. I mean, people don't want that. The public has spoken. Uh, Vinyl sells more than CDs now. I mean, now, now, like this year, because of that's what people want, you know? And the record companies don't really respond to the public because they think they know better, which they don't. But uh, here's the, the song order, which was another thing. In the olden days, there were two sides, so you flip the record. So the last song on side one is called The Album Turner. Here it's I'm Falling, which I just did a cover of that song. And it's, uh, you know, it makes you want to turn the record and continue the journey. And then Wreckage is a real moody, emotional song. That's the last song. Surrender is a really revved up, fast song. So there was thought put into sequencing back in those days. Now, uh, Surrender features a female singer uh, duetting with Peter Wolf. Do you know who that female singer is? Sissy Houston. Where do I know that name from? Houston. Do you know anybody who's a really good female R&B singer with the last name Houston? Whitney Houston. Sissy Houston is Whitney Houston's mother. Uh, Whitney Houston, rest in peace. So there's Jay. There's Mr. Blad, Stephen Joe. Looking handsome as always. Magic Dick, talk to me. Seth Justman, DK, and the profile of Peter Wolf. Styling and profiling. I'm Not Rough is on here. That's a, uh, what's it called? 
uh, Louis Armstrong tune and the art the Louis Armstrong original he goes I need a dark-skinned woman to satisfy my mind Peter Wolf changed it to a real wild woman you know probably for you know just to avoid too much flack you know not not Roberta flack the other kind of flack like a flack jacket Peter Wolf has said this in interviews many times, and it's a hundred percent true. There, this horrible prejudice, you know, it really messed them up. And uh, they used to tour with the Allman Brothers band, which is a mixed band, you know, mixed race. They got black guys, white guys, Mexican guys, and they dealt with a lot of crap in the old days. For for what for? having black guys in a band that's based on the blues uh yeah i used to be in a band with a really racist dude who played bass and i told him i'm like dude are you sure that you're playing the right kind of music here because this is rock and roll it's based off the blues if you don't like african-american people maybe you should not be involved in their art form that they gave us food for thought so anyway uh here's an, another picture from the inside cover where they have information about who did what and that's what people used to love to read and then here's mr blad holding a glass of scotch because these guys were a party band but jay got uh blah, 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 monkey island monkey Island. oh yeah this is uncensored burps and all Monkey Island is their deepest album by far, and it's my personal favorite because it has very deep, very emotional lyrics. There's party stuff on there too, but it's not all party. It's actually really, really introspective. And they also mixed, uh, this is what Seth Justman was a wizard with doing. Like I said, they were on the cutting edge of technology at that time. He would mix brand new synthesizers from analog to digital. He would do studio stuff. He was a great producer. So he would put like backwards stuff in there, like a backwards symbol where you hit a symbol, right? Turn the tape backwards and it goes. Uh, another one bites the dust by Queen in the middle part. There's a part, it sounds like a synthesizer, but it's a backwards piano. Like he just hit the low note on the piano, it goes because the attack is at the end and the decay is at the beginning. These are technical terms, right? But this is not rocket science, it's rock and roll. All right, let's go, let's go. So after they got uh, dropped for Monkey Island, they went ahead and made Sanctuary. And I believe uh, they made this at a dairy farm. I think they made all of their albums after that on a, a, a real dairy farm in Massachusetts. And then they would have to go into the city to party. But uh, it was really, uh, they didn't have any money and they had to keep touring. So they, uh, they rushed it. And a lot of bands did this back in the day. They had to rush their albums because you know, they couldn't afford to be Michael Jackson and spend like a, a year making an album. So they had to get back on the road, but they did a lot with what they had and there was no Pro Tools, no Auto-Tune. It was all real people playing real instruments. There he is, Mr. Seth Justman. He's got a clavinet, that's the uh, Superstition, Stevie Wonder thing. Bet, 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 clavinet with a, it looks like a Mutron, um, what is that, a phaser pedal on the top. That's vintage as hell. You can't afford that and neither can I. But back in the day, a lot of people had them. Uh, Hammond B3 and Yamaha CP80 electric piano. And look at this. He put a mirror on top of the piano so he could see the other guys when he's, his back was turned. And he has a microphone because he sings back up. Crazy. In some of the old videos, he's jamming out so hard that this mirror is just shaking. And it looks like it's going to break. I'm like, dude, protect your face, man. Uh, he was on a different level. Oh, snap. Check this out. 
What's this, baby? More cowbell. That's a cowbell on top of the Hammond organ. It doesn't get much cooler than that. All right, so the next album after Sanctuary was Love Stinks. And there they are, the lovely, lovely couple. They stink. <clears throat> This is a shot from the video. So these guys embraced MTV when it came along. They had been around for uh, 10 years already on the road. And then they started making these videos that, and they became like teen idols when they were in their 30s, you know? <laughs> Same thing with Springsteen, born in the USA. He's like, man, I'm a teen idol at age 35? Who, what? <laughs> so the whole video is like this, like everything stinks, right? They got gas masks. Uh, Peter Wolf is in bed with a, with a dead fish. Stephen Joe Blad is playing drums with a dead fish. There's, you know, cigarettes, because you could show that on TV back in the day. Like, uh, DK takes the smoke out of his mouth. No, stinks. You know? uh, a gym. They're performing in a high school gym <laughs> with the Yamaha CS80. Not the same thing as a CP80. Incidentally, I just ordered a Yamaha Reface CS which is a new and compact version. And it's digital, you can hook it up to the computer. It's, it's awesome. I'm collecting the whole Reface series. I got the YC organ, the DX synth, digital synth, CS analog synth on the way. And then the last one is the CP, which is electric piano. These things are so popular because they're so good and they're uh, they're selling out fast so it's hard to get them now so i'm grabbing them up while i can but i recommend these things for every piano player whether you're a professional or a beginner like my dad told me with the guitar i wanted to get a squire and he said no no get a real fender because you're gonna keep it for life right you're gonna practice a lot right you're not gonna quit you're not gonna put it down well, yeah, right. That's what I did. So, um, so if you're gonna start playing piano, don't get a Casio, you know, because you're just gonna end up uh, graduating to something better eventually anyway. So get something good, and it's not expensive. It's like five hundred dollars, you know. I know, I know, I know. Andrew Yang said most American people don't have four hundred bucks for an emergency. <sighs> That's very sad. You should have $10,000 in cash, not in a bank, cash for emergencies or six months worth of expenses, whichever is larger. And the more the merrier, you know, don't stop at 10,000 if you can get 100, you know what I mean? Mm. But this ain't all about the money, you see? This is so much fun. hand sanitizer uh, this is so much fun this rock and roll English teachers network that um, it doesn't feel like work I mean it is tiring but it's so satisfying and the money will come you know the money comes in time when you do what you love it's worth it a hundred percent and the people that talk down to you and say you'll never be anything I, I worked at McDonald's for like six six weeks when I was 16 years old, and then they wanted me to work on 420. I was like, hell no, I'm not working on 420. That's a holiday. And then the uh, the manager lady, this big ugly ugly thing, she's like, you'll never amount to anything. You're a loser. I said, listen, don't you ever say that to me or any other young man again. You're, you're 40 years old and you're working at McDonald's. Don't you dare tell people that they'll never amount to anything. I took off my, my apron, threw it at her, took my paycheck, which was like, I don't know, $50 or something, and bought some weed. All right, so, yeah, right? See, I, I didn't amount to anything, right? Because I was a pothead, a loser, and now I'm... Now I'm worldwide, baby, and I'm doing very positive things, right? So don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. 
or how lame you are. Unless you are lame, in, in which case, get cool, you know, get better. But I want to hear about what I can do. I don't want to hear about what I can't do. That's a waste of time. All right, so check this, check this. This crazy looking album cover, this was drawn by Seth Justman. You're getting, that's right, it has an apostrophe. You're getting even while I'm getting odd. This is the final Jay Giles band album. And unfortunately, a lot of people hate it, but I think it's great. Uh, Seth Justman and Peter Wolf wrote all the songs together throughout their career. But uh, when it came time for the big hits, Centerfold the, and uh, Freeze Frame, that whole album, Angel and Blue, every song on Freeze Frame is written by Seth Justman alone. Then I think he's like a mega multimillionaire as a result. And he produced albums for Debbie Harry from Blondie, and uh, he did some film soundtracks. So, so Peter Wolf and him had like a falling out. Uh, Peter ended up going on to do his own, uh, you know, his solo project. And then he, uh, he was on Artists Against Apartheid, the Little Steven album. He was rapping with Run DMC. So that goes, goes further into the concept that this is an African-American art form. So he was, you know, he was a white rapper before there was rap, like in the 70s. And he developed that thing, you know. So uh, he was on the pulse. And then uh, Seth Justman went and produced this album, played keys, sang lead. And the drummer, Steven, played, uh, sings lead as well on a couple tracks. Sadly, though, uh, while both of them are really competent singers, they're not front men. Like I said, uh, Peter Wolf is like the consummate front man. He's up there with Jagger, Freddie Mercury, you know, you name it. He's, he's the real deal. But Seth Justman just couldn't do everything at once. And people hate this album because it's very heavy on the synthesizers and the studio tricks, but he also mixed it with R&B, old school, you know, piano, uh, Hammond B3. I think it was very well executed. So the haters can hate all they want. They hate themselves. There's Magic Dick. Talk to me, baby. Wow, wow. Blow your face out. Nice. Leather pants. All right, and there's Stephen Joe Blad. Uh, this is after he uh, retired, so I guess maybe he's just jamming here. Not looks like he's in a bar or something like that. He's not like in a stadium, but he's a cool guy and he sings great. And here he is singing, singing and playing at the same time. Look at these concert toms with no bottom heads and the the mics inside the drum. For Kurt, I think it was Kurt Loader. He said uh, Stephen Joe Blad's drums sound like wet cardboard boxes, and I mean that in the most respectful way possible. You know, something like that. Boom! Look at all those toms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's all eight we can see, and only two cymbals. <laughs> oh man, he was cool. And only one bass drum, right? No double bass. He was like uh, Max Weinberg, like he can play double bass with one foot. And uh, John Bonham, you know, guys like that, they didn't need the big drum kits. Well, this is a big drum kit, but it doesn't have two bass drums. There's Jay Giles uh, towards the end of his life, I guess, uh, doing his blues. Jay Giles and Magic Dick got together and made uh, Blues Time, which was like a straight blues jazz band. I think it was in the 90s. They made like two albums. And once again, not even not for big money, just for fun. Because these guys loved to, what they did. And uh, may he rest in peace. Alright. Stephen Joe Blatt. Peter Wolf. Look at that handsome old man. Man, e even the Boston Marathon bombers couldn't stop Woofa Goofa. He's got the, you know... The handkerchief, which, uh, you know, to paraphrase Robert De Niro from that movie where he plays like the old guy working in the tech startup company in Brooklyn or whatever, 
he says like, uh, you know, in my day, men didn't wear a handkerchief in their pocket for themselves. We wore it for the ladies and it wasn't to show off for them. It's if a woman starts crying, you hand it to her and she'll love you for it, right? Old school, this guy understands. He was married to Faye Dunaway, the famous actress from UHF and Bonnie and Clyde in the 70s, the yeah, Oscar winning actress. And they're still really good friends. Like they, she says in an interview, they broke the mold after they made Peter Wolf. There will always be a place in my heart for Peter Wolf. And he, uh, he wrote Love Stinks about her and, and a bunch of other songs too. But, uh, but they're, you know, they just had a, uh, they had a good relationship, but it, it, it was hard for people like that. You know, if you're both famous and she's making movies and he's on tour, they spent too much time apart and they never had children, I don't think. So it is what it is. They should get back together now because they're old, you know, <laughs> like they should just get back together, you know, take some Viagra and have, have one last romp in the hay. And finally, Studio Giles. So there's the, the custom flying V base. There's Peter Wolf with his beard intact. And it, now he has a goatee too, it's all gray. Bruce Springsteen should grow his beard back too. Like uh, this is around the same time as Born to Run, like 70s, 75, something like that. There's Jay Giles with the Stratocaster. There's the uh, the Flying V, the Les Paul, and an acoustic, it looks like. There's Magic Dick with a huge harmonica that's like bigger than his hand. And there's Justman with his shirt open looking cool as hell. Wow. Any questions? All right, so check this out. So there's a story in the, um, I'll leave you with this, in the, in the old uh, Rolling Stone interview, uh, or the Rolling Stone Kurt Loader thing, they're talking about Yayo, you know, which is <laughs> Colombian marching powder. And, uh, mm, uh, yeah, like that. Makes your nose red. So, uh, <laughs> so Matt, uh, not Magic Dick, uh, DK, bass player. He used to say like he'd he'd be backstage like I'm I'm peeking now I'm peeking now you know his eyes bugging out can we please go on stage now before I come down you know and they're talking about they were in like like bumfuck Texas somewhere drinking at this saloon or no no Missoula Montana which is where Glacial Lake Missoula is located it's um. A glacial lake, a lake created by a glacier, and there's a bunch of dinosaur bones and stuff there. So, uh, the, but the city is like Nowhereville, USA. Uh, so they went to a little shit kicker bar, and it got late, and everyone was getting drunk. Peter Wolf told the story like it's past that hour. Like they say, nothing good ever happened after 1 a.m. in a bar. So. Uh, you know, people started to get too drunk. No, people weren't thinking straight. And he's like getting the boys together, like, come on, let's get out of here. Let's go to the hotel. And they couldn't find DK. Where is he? Where is he? They couldn't find him anywhere. And like the bartender was telling them this story about this uh, foreigner. They, well, they are like foreigners, you know, the way they treat each other. Um, you know, somebody from New York or something like that uh, was in this bar in Missoula. And he said, you know, this guy just got all fucked up and he was talking shit. And these guys took him out back into the alley and just shot him. And, you know, these guys are freaking out. They look and looking in the alley. Where's DK? Where's DK? Oh, my God. And then a limousine pulls up, a long black limousine. And DK gets out and slams the door. And he's like, man, man, those guys had some good shit. But can you believe they actually wanted me to pay for it? I was like, don't you know who I am? <laughs> Till the walls come tumbling down. Thank you. And now we return to your regu regularly scheduled programming. Rest in peace.